The Oscar Wilde novel called The Picture of Dorian Gray begins with a young man named Dorian sitting for a portrait. And as he is sitting for the portrait, this artist becomes just captivated by the impossible beauty of this young man. He said it changed his art forever. And in the end, he gives this portrait to Dorian to keep. But in the process of being painted, Dorian goes from being sort of a humble and and prudish young man to realizing just how handsome he is. And he begins thinking about the future and and how his beauty will fade with time. And, And so he wishes with everything in him that instead of him looking older with time, that the portrait would bear the marks of age. And so he gets his wish. And with this newfound lease on life, he begins to pursue pleasure wherever he can find it using his beauty and wealth. And soon he falls in love with a local actress and is captivated by her beauty. And she falls in love with him, but then she leaves her acting in order to be with him. And then he tells her, no, your beauty was your acting. And he abandons her. She's devastated. And he goes home and, and after thinking about it for a while, he says that that wasn't probably the right thing to do. And so he, he intends to go back and make amends. But before he can, he finds out that she's killed herself. He returns home and, and he uh, happens to get a glance at the portrait of himself. And he realizes that it's changed. It's a subtle change, but the portrait now bears lines of cruelty in the face and and, and fear strikes him. And so he takes the portrait and he hides it away in a desolate upstairs room in his house where nobody but he will be able to see it. And over the next 18 years, he continues this journey of pursuing vice and wickedness in every possible way. And all the while, the painting bears the marks of grotesque sin while he stays an attractive young man to everybody who sees him on the outside. After 18 years, uh, that painter who painted the portrait of Dorian is hearing rumors of Dorian's activity around town, horrible rumors, and he goes to confront him to his house. And at the house, he sees that portrait and he can hardly recognize that it's his own work. It's so ugly. It's so grotesque. And he pieces together what Dorian has done and he pleads with him, Dorian, repent, repent of your sins. And Dorian says, no, it's too late. And then in a fit of rage, he kills the man who painted the portrait. Dorian goes on living this way for uh, a bit longer, but then he realizes this life of pursuing wickedness just is not living up to all that it had promised. And so he says, I'm going to have a moral reformation, change my ways. And so he does this for a short period of time. And and then he, he goes back to check on the painting in hopes that it has maybe become more like the original. But instead of becoming more beautiful, it has become even more hideous because the sincerity wasn't there. He realizes that his motives for his moral reformation were only to cover up the past sins. And so in an act of desperation, he he does the only thing that there is to do left to destroy the painting, the physical reminder of his hidden life. And so he takes the knife and he stabs it into the painting. And the moment he does, the servants of the house hear a scream come from the upstairs room. And they run up and they open the door and they see on the ground the body of a very old, hideous man that they can't recognize with a knife through his heart. And in front of the man is a portrait, a pristine portrait of a young, handsome Dorian Gray. This is our final week in a sermon series out of the book of Psalms. And today we're going to be walking through Psalm 32, which was written by a man who knew what it was like to pursue pleasure in the wrong places. A man who knew what it was like to lead a secret life and to work hard to cover it up. But by God's grace, this man's story ends differently than Dorian Gray's. And by God's grace, he committed his story and his struggle to writing so that generation after generation following would be able to read and identify with and learn from this man. This man is David, who was an Israelite poet, warrior, king. How about that for a resume, right? David is possibly writing this psalm as a reflection on his sin with a woman named Bathsheba, if you know that story. But there's not an explicit connection, so this could just be a psalm written as a general reflection on sin and confession and finding freedom. David is our case study for today, not because he's perfect, but precisely because he isn't. 
And this psalm walks us through David's journey of sin and finding forgiveness. The psalm is divided up into five different parts, and the first part is dedicated to describing David's target in life, the thing that he's aiming at. Psalm 32 begins this way. It says, of David, a mascal. Uh, by the way, that word mascal, it has a debated meaning. It's either a note about the musical nature of this psalm, or it's saying that this is a psalm that imparts wisdom. Okay, so one of those two. David says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And around here, we like to thank God for speaking to us through his word. So let's do that now. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. David begins this psalm with the words, blessed is the one. Okay, so blessed is a word that it can be translated quite simply as happy. And so David is describing somebody who has found happiness. He says, this is the life that is worth living. And, and this may make some of us uneasy because when we think of somebody just pursuing whatever would make them happy, we think of the approach that Dorian Gray took, right? Or maybe the Christian version of this, which sort of smacks of your best life now, right? Health and wealth and prosperity, which chafes against what we know to be the call of Jesus, which is self-denial, and then just kind of general difficult circumstances in life, right? So what is this about happiness? But, but thought leaders down through the ages have argued that if you peel back the layers, the difference between each one of us is not actually the target of our pursuits, but rather just the path how to get there. And so both Plato and Aristotle said that every desire that we have is for good things, or for happiness. The French theologian Blaise Pascal said, all people are in search of happiness. There is no exception to this. C.S. Lewis may surprise you when he says that it is a Christian duty for everyone to be as happy as he can. And indeed, baked into the very fabric of our nation is the notion that we are entitled to a life of lib life and liberty and pursuit of happiness. And here David affirms what has been taught so long by people inside and outside the Bible, that there is such a thing as the happy life and we ought to pursue it. So whether you're listening today as a follower of Jesus, or maybe you're somebody tuning in and you're just exploring, or maybe you're decidedly against anything related to faith, the reality is we are all pursuing the exact same thing, happiness. We may disagree on what that looks like or how to get there, but for each one of us, the target of everything in our life is happiness. So what does David say is the secret to the happy life, right? Million dollar question. He says a life marked by forgiveness is what makes a person blessed. But those of us who are honest would say uh, that there is a gap between us and happiness or joy. What creates this gap? David uses two words to describe what creates it in the first couple verses of Psalm 32. So first, sin. This is missing the mark of how we ought to conduct ourselves as humans, okay? Sin. And the second word is transgressions. This is overstepping good and right boundaries that God has established for humans to flourish in the world. So the story of scripture is not that humans are basically good, but that humanity is sick with a universal sin nature. We are mark missers and boundary crossers. And left up to our own devices, we're going to make a mess of ourselves and the world around us. Aren't we seeing it? This is ultimately rebellion against the God who made us in kindness and made the world out of his love. And so sin is not just a, a, a problem out there. It's a relational problem between us and God, and it creates a gap between us and him. This is the universal problem laid out in the opening pages of the Bible. So what are we to do about this gap? That's the question that we're going to look at through the lens of David's experience. Faced with the gap of his own sin, David describes the temptation that every single one of us feels when we sin, which is to hide it. Verse three, he says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. 
So David is painting for us a before picture in his journey, right? This is the bondage of secrecy. This is somebody who is bought into the lie that living in the darkness is better and is now experiencing the agony of living a secret life. So so you can indeed live a life of secret sin. Some of you are doing it right now. But what happens when we let that carry on? Inevitably, some combination of three things will happen. Number one, in all likelihood, eventually your sin will be found out, okay? So at one point in time, David, uh, he used his kingly power. He set his sights on a woman, used his kingly power to bring her to him. She was a married woman. Her name was Bathsheba. And her husband was off fighting David's war. And David gets her pregnant. And then he brings Uriah back from battle to try to time it to make it look like the father is Uriah. And when that doesn't work, he puts Uriah smack in the middle of the battle that he knows will get him killed. So in short order, David commits adultery and then murder. And then David is approached by this man named Nathan. And in what could be a a scene straight out of a Jerry Springer episode, David's sin is called out. It's exposed. The further ingrown a sin gets, the more effort it takes to maintain the lie and then the web of lies after that. And the reality is eventually it will catch up with you and you will be stuck with some really painful consequences. Some of you know somebody who's gone through that. Some of you are that person who's gone through that. Second possibility, your life might just become miserable. Okay, the Spirit of God may work in you in such a way that your bones feel like they're wasting away, as David says, right? Your energy might be sapped. You might live with a constant low-grade anxiety, like there's a heavy hand weighing upon you. But this discomfort and this agony is actually a mercy. You see, God's universal gift to mankind is this thing called a conscience, and our conscience is often what God uses to get our attention, and so we can't sleep And we can't eat. We lose our appetite. We experience the stress and anxiety of living a life of secrecy and duplicity. Third possibility, and actually the most dangerous possibility of all, is that your soul might just become bent in the wrong direction. Okay, so verse 2 says, Blessed is the one in whose spirit there is no deceit. When we keep our sin hidden— deception begins to take root. There's obviously deception towards other people, right? We put up a portrait of ourselves that doesn't actually mirror who we are on the inside. But even more dangerously, self-deception begins to take root. This is when you lie to yourself. You begin to believe your own lies. And if you cling to your secret sin long enough, the reality is your heart will become callous to the things in life that matter most, which is intimacy and love and joy. Dorian Gray experiences a really horrible combination of all three of these things, right? So his sin is found out, his life is miserable, and by the end of the story, his soul is bent. It's warped under the weight of deception and guilt. None of these are good options for somebody pursuing the happy life, right? So what gives? For those of you who are experiencing the agony of living a secret life, I want you to know that there is a better way forward. And that's what the next part of David's story is all about. He reaches a turning point. Verse 5. He says, then I acknowledge my sin to you. He's talking to God. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. This is the turning point in David's journey, right? There's a before and then there's an after and there's a turning point in the middle. And this turning point is called confession. Confession is the act that breaks the power and cycle of sin. Okay, so sin loves to grow in the dark and confession is the act of dragging it out into the light. This is precisely what Dorian Gray never did. Confession is uncovering your sin and naming your sin to the people who've been affected by it. This is always God, but it oftentimes includes other people around you. So as you look at your life, friends, today, what is it that you tend to cover up? What is it that you're covering up right now? Is it lying to your parents? Is it cheating on schoolwork? For those of you who are in school, 
Is it some sort of secret hidden addiction or habit that, that has you wrapped around its finger? It's, it's alcohol, it's pornography, it's overeating. Are you wrapped up in a, an affair that you're keeping secret? What, what is the thing that if somebody close to you texted you right now and said, I know what you have been hiding, what would come to mind? What is the portrait that you are keeping hidden in the upstairs room of your house? Sin grows in the dark and confession brings it to light. And that's what David does. And when he does, his entire situation changes, right? So after he sins, he covers up his sin. He's silent about it. God's hand is heavy upon it. It feels like his bones are wasting away. And then he reaches this point where he confesses. And when he does, we see this beautiful, simple phrase. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Just like that, David's life is transformed by an encounter with the God of grace. And this is what prompts him to say in verse one, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. The person who experiences forgiveness, the forgiveness of God is the one who's called blessed. He experiences the happy life. So that's it, right? Just confess. There's a problem. And those of you who are living a secret life, you know this. Confession can be scary, like really, really scary. Even for those of us who understand up here that confession is what we should do, we don't confess because that requires vulnerability. And vulnerability makes us scared. It makes us feel insecure. And when we feel insecure, we reach for the thing that makes us feel like we are in control. And this is what makes us hide and manage our sin. It's, it's to control it. But confession is just the opposite. It means letting go of our sin, to, to become vulnerable. And so you see the problem. As long as we feel that exposure is going to harm us, we will never be vulnerable enough to open up, to confess our sin. In other words, until we have a good reason to believe that after we are exposed, that we will still be okay, we will never admit the hard truths. So what are, what are we to do? We have to be sure that it's worth it, that when we confess that in the end, we will be okay. Growing up, I played baseball. Baseball was like my main thing. And then when I got into high school, it was like really my main thing. And one of the things I was particularly good at was stealing bases. I was pretty quick and I got to read pictures pretty well. And so I would steal a lot of bases. And during my sophomore year, we were playing an away game and uh, I had just gotten to first base. And the pitcher got set. I took my lead, read him, and as soon as he picked up that foot, I took off for second. And the catcher did a pretty quick turnaround, but I slid feet first into second base safely. Uh, the throw, though, was high and to the right, and the catcher, the second baseman, had to jump up to grab it. Now, my foot was on top of second base, which meant there was like four or five inches of air between my knee and the ground. And I watched as the second baseman landed with all of his weight on the outside of my knee. I, I was in excruciating pain. I was in so much pain I could hardly see. And, and when kind of the dust settled, my, my teammates came running out of the field and with the help of uh, a couple of friends, made my way to the dugout. And I sat there on the bench thinking, this injury is going to set me out for weeks, if not months. Turns out I had hyperextended my MCL and I did what a lot of people who <laughs> undergo injuries in sports do, signed up for physical therapy. And my physical therapist was a beast of a man. He was six foot five, he was 250 pounds and Mormon. Now Mormons are like supposed to be nice. This guy was not nice to me. He, he would like work my leg to the point where I would nearly pass out. I, I made this known to him and his response was, that's how you know it's working. Right. Okay. That makes me feel good. So sometime during like our second session, uh, he said, this next part is going to hurt. To which I said, it all hurts. And he said, this next part is going to hurt. And I'm going to hold it for 15 seconds. 
and he grabbed my leg and he did something that he had never done before. And it felt like I was injuring it all over again. I was like seeing stars and sweating and, f- and I was like hitting his arm. I was like, stop, stop, stop. And Mormon Hulk just held my leg there for every bit of the 15 seconds that he had promised. And finally he let go and I just laid back. And, and after I recovered, I, I said, why didn't you stop when I wanted? And he said, because I know what you want more, which is to get your leg back. I believe it or not, I kept coming back to this guy's house and the ride over there was like awful. I was like riddled with anxiety the entire time. And yet I kept coming back and putting myself in, in the hands of, uh, of somebody who was much bigger and stronger than me and, and who was okay with seeing me in quite a bit of pain because I knew that this was productive pain. It was pain with a purpose. It was the kind of pain that sets things right again. See, confession, friends, can be extremely painful, but it is not the most painful thing. Confession may be really painful, but it is nothing compared to the pain that unconfessed sin leads to. Secret sin comes with the pain that leads to death, but confession is the pain that sets things right again. But what does it mean for things to be set right again? What does that look like? We know that confession is painful, and so we have to ask, what could possibly be worth the leap of letting go of our grasp of security and entering into vulnerability? What is it that made it worth it for David? The answer to that is an experience of transformation, which is what we read about in verses 6 and 7. David says, Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. See, in these verses, you see David has a transformed relationship with God. Earlier, God described God's heavy, or David described God's heavy hand on him, and God's nearness to him felt like his bones were wasting away. So David's response was to to run and hide, right? So so God's presence in our lives, friends, is, is polarizing. When he draws near to us, we get clarity about what's happening in our own hearts. And what David saw in his heart was ugly. But now things have changed. Now instead of running from God, uh, David is running to God. Instead of hiding away from God, David is saying, God, you are my hiding place. The sound of God's voice for David is now sweet. He said, God, you sing songs of deliverance over me. This is a different David. This is David after his turning point. And what transformed David's relationship with God is what he did with his sin. Instead of covering it up, he confessed it. And what David saw was that God was not waiting for him with a stick. He was not waiting for him with shame and punishment, but rather with affection and protection. Like many of you listening, I have personally experienced living under the weight of hidden sin and and shame. What what it's like to, to feel like you're living a double life, constantly looking over your shoulder and wondering, am I going to be found out? But I've also experienced the freedom of living in the light knowing that I've laid my sin before God and for, before other people, having confessed and said, I'm not going to live a charade anymore. And I'm telling you, when you don't live under the weight of shame and anxiety, everything in life is better. There's true life to be found in walking in light and closeness with God. Some of you have resisted bringing your sin into the light because that every time you fall on your face, that you mess up, you, you, you white knuckle it. You tell yourself, I'm just going to do better from here on out. But here's the problem with that. Number one, that rarely actually works in the long run. And number two, even when it does, you will still not get the joy you are looking for. And here's why. Because the gap between you and joy is the gap between you and joy and God. Which means that if your plan to achieve joy does not include God, then you will miss the target every time. 
If you are white knuckling your way to self-righteousness over here while keeping God over here, you will never experience the joy that you are looking for. You see, the problem is it's actually not sin itself. It's the gap that sin creates. And this is an important distinction because for some of us, our end goal right now is to just live a more moral life, just to sin less. But the problem with this is that you can live a more moral life and still be far from God. This is the older son and the prodigal son story, right? You can stay close to home, as it were, and still be distant from the father. So the goal is not to just not sin. God is not just the means by which we get forgiveness. God gets us forgiveness, but friends, forgiveness gets us God. And when you get God, you get joy. God is what our hearts long for. And so if you want to close the gap between you and the joy that you are looking for, close the gap between you and God. The way that you do that is to confess. Confession closes the gap. Okay, so some of you are thinking, okay, that sounds nice. I would love to experience closeness with God like what David experienced, but the reality is I'm not so sure that God wants to be close to me. I'm not sure God likes who I am. Right? The cultural water that we swim in tells us that our actions determine our identity, right? That performance determines our worth, that we are what we do. And for those of us with secrets, that is terrifying. So what are we to do? For a long time, uh, I have a younger son, Keller, and he is five years old now. And for a long time, Keller was um, really nervous to color, like on coloring sheets around me. And so we'd be coloring, and then he would like just hand me the marker and say, Dad, you do it. And I'd be like, why, why, like other kids love to color. Why doesn't my son love to color? I was sitting with him one day, and he was coloring, and I watched as his hand strayed out of the line. And then his head sank, and he put down the pen, and he turned away from me. And in that moment, I realized that Keller thought that coloring was fun only when he stayed perfectly within the lines around me. I had never told him that, but somehow he'd picked that up. And so in that moment, I I grabbed Keller's hands and I said, buddy, I love you. And I have fun coloring with you, even when you color out of the lines. And, And since then, Keller has gotten a lot more comfortable coloring on coloring sheets of paper. But in that moment, he needed to hear that when he messed up a coloring page, it didn't mean that he was a messed up boy. Friends, please hear this. You will never confess your failings until your performance doesn't define you. I'll say that one more time. You will never confess your failings until your performance doesn't define you. Whatever lies have been spoken to you, whatever lies have been lodged in your heart or in your mind, the gospel proclaims a louder truth. God is for you. You are not defined by how lovable you are. You are defined by the one who has loved you without condition. You are not defined by your victories or your sins. You are defined by the one who has earned victory over your sins through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is a God who says, even when you color outside of the lines, I still love you. So, let go. Let go and come to him. Let go of whatever you have been hiding and enter into the joy of the Father who loves you. There's one final part to David's journey for us to look at. And that is that he has tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and now he has a teaching opportunity. Notice in verse 8 how David switches away from talking to the Lord, and now he's talking to those who are listening. That's us. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. 
Okay, so what's the teaching opportunity? Two things. First, let David's story teach you. Okay, so why does David t- tell his story? He tells his story to cultivate faith for those who are listening to his story. That includes us. He says it's a good and right thing to give up control, to enter into vulnerability in confession, because when you come out on the other side, you will experience love and intimacy and joy. His story teaches us that. Friends, God wants you to be freed from your woes. A a woe is something that causes sorrow or distress. And when we walk under the strain of guilt and shame, we will experience woes. The the, the wicked carry woes. The forgiven don't. So, So listen to David. Those of you who are hiding something, listen to David. Don't be stubborn. Be open to instruction. Learn from those who have gone before you, including David. Learn from his mistakes and and listen to him when he says, trust me, I have lived the secret life of sin. And it leads to death. Confess to close that gap. And if you're not somebody who's ever trusted in Jesus, then then confess for the first time. Trust in Jesus. Repent of your sins. Say, Jesus, you are better. See, Jesus took your guilt and shame at the cross so that you might be freed from the weight of guilt and shame so that you could experience a transformation in your relationship with God. So, So drop the pretenses. Come into the light. Trust in this Jesus who lived in your place and died in your place, receive the forgiveness he offers and walk in the joy of a savior. For those of you who have been following Jesus, you are following Jesus. For this, for you, this means keep short accounts. Keep short accounts. Don't let the gap remain for any period of time. Confess quickly. And I, and I know confession is not fun. I, I have routines and rhythms built into my daily life to confess, repent, because I know that confession is not fun. So I begin every day with a structured prayer time. And in that structured prayer time, there's a time for confession where I look back at the last 24 hours and I say, God, how in my thoughts and words and, and, and actions have I sinned? And I confess those to God. I have an accountability partner and we ask each other, hard questions on a regular basis. My wife and I, my wife Kasha, we every day built into our routine, there's a time where we say, here's how I have sinned today. I'm going to own it. I'm going to name it. I'm going to own it. And I'm going to ask for forgiveness. Will you forgive me? And, and, and to model this for our kids, every night at dinner time, we, we, when we pray, we have a structured prayer time that says, please, and I'm sorry, and thank you. You've, you've heard this uh, prayer around Christ community, and we do that at dinner time so that every day we model for our kids, mom and dad, saying, I'm in need of grace too. I'm sorry, God. Would you forgive me? Confession is not fun. Until you build in disciplines in your daily life, it probably is not going to happen. So go ahead and do it. So let David's story teach you. Second, let your story teach others. Okay, so some of you have experienced this transformation, right? You've experienced a transition from living in darkness to now light. You know firsthand what it's like to live in that victory. You don't have to look over your shoulders. You don't have to hide. You don't have to live in constant anxiety over being found out. You've experienced the goodness of Jesus And the truth of his promise when he says, the one whom the son sets free is free indeed. And your response today may may just be celebrate that. Rejoice in your savior. But it also might be to share your story. Okay, so look at what David is doing in this psalm. He's saying, I'm making my story into a public declaration of praise so that other people can hear it. And friends who are walking in in victory, there are people around you in your life, maybe even sitting around you right now, maybe in your neighborhood or your community group or your workplace who are living a life of secret sin. And they are are wondering, they, they, they can't imagine a world in which their story ends well. And so they keep it hidden. They need to hear your story. They need to see that this confession thing works They need to see that the recovery is worth the physical therapy. They need a sweet song of deliverance. And maybe, friends, maybe the song of deliverance that the Lord wants to sing over them is your 
story. So share it. David concludes Psalm 32 with one of the most common and one of my favorite commands in all of scripture, which is this. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Right? So this is the bookend to verse 1 when he said, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. After all, what is it that happy people do? They rejoice. They sing. And in just a moment, you'll have a chance to do just that. God's command to you, friends, is to rejoice. His desire for you is that you would find and take hold of a life of joy. This joy is to be found in the God who loves you. And confession will close that gap. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love and your faithfulness to us who are not deserving. God, thank you for your kindness, which leads us to repentance. We thank you for the promise of abundant life in Jesus. May we take a hold of the good news, responding in repentance and faith, and see that the prize of Jesus is worth the pain of confession. God, may those of us who have been hiding begin walking in the light. And may those of us who are walking in the light use our stories to point to your goodness and grace. We love you. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.